Greetings, greetings everyone. Kalisperasis. I hope you've all had an enjoyable um, uh, Easter break and a break from the seminars. And it's great to see people returning to the CBD and the city slowly returning uh, back, to, um, back to normal. Just a few housekeeping items before we commence uh, with tonight's seminar. The bus is uh, Songs of Liberation musical performance at the end of May has been sold out, but there is a, possib a possibility that a few more tickets will be released, so keep an eye out on them, or leave your contact details with the Greek community if you're sort of still interested. It's been a sellout uh, concert. Um, there will be a special screening of King Otto, Greece's triumph in the 2004 Euros, at the Astor Theatre on Sunday the 16th of May, 7 p.m., and tickets are on sale now. All Thursday seminars for the rest of the year will be of a hybrid nature and conducted out of the mezzanine, so we'd like to see you here. We encourage you all to attend in person uh, when possible. And next week's seminar will be, uh, and simultaneously they'll be streamed on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, next week's seminar will be by Dean Kalimnio commemorating the Pontian Genocide Memorial Day. For those online, follow us on Facebook or YouTube. Just submit any questions through the comments section and we'll try to you know, intercept them. Um, now returning to tonight's seminar which has been sponsored by the Battle of Crete in Greece Commemorative Council, uh, honouring those who have fallen during these World War II events. Thank you for your sponsorship. Battle of Crete veterans that have played VFL, what an out of the blue topic. Never in my wildest dreams would I have expected a topic on VFL AFL as part of a Greek History and Culture Seminar Series. The football code of VFL AFL has very strong local roots in Victoria. And at first sight, I'm sure many of our parents' generation would say, uh, how can Aussie rules have any connection to Greece? But if you scratch the surface and dig a little deeper, you'll find that there is a connection, actually a blood bond, a bond of sacrifice, a bond of mutual respect. 22 former VFL players took part in the Battle of Crete in Greece, with five of them dying in active service. And this year being the eighth anniversary, it's a fitting way to pay tribute to these young men. Uh, and to present tonight's seminar, I'm delighted to welcome to the um, Greek Centre uh, for the first time, ex Hawksburn primary teacher, I, I, had, I think I had to get that in, uh, Barbara Cullen. Barbara has been um, Secretary of the Australian Football Heritage Group for the past 25 years and in 2006 she was honoured as AFL Football Woman of the Year for her service to football history. I don't think um, she could have ever escaped this interest in football and war service. Um, as numerous family members and relatives have partaken in one or the other or both. And with any type of sport or vocation, once the microbe enters the system, one stays passionate for the rest of their lives. In 2015, Barbara published her book, Harder Than Football. Uh, this, massive this massive tome you, hear, you see here at the front, which took six years of research. It's almost two PhDs, Barbara. Uh, it documents and pays tribute to the, to the war service of 2,500 AFL-VFL footballers from the Boer War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the National Service. This includes the 22 players who served in Greece and Crete during the World War II campaign. Today, we have on sale her remaining copies. There's only about a dozen left, sold at, sold at the back at a very special price. They surely will remain collector items, and I encourage you all to um, purchase a copy. I welcome Barbara to the podium, and a big round of applause for our speaker tonight, please. Calispera. That's about it. <laughs> no, my Greek is gradually improving after teaching at Hawksburn Primary School, including the gentleman up the back, son Con. Um, I did learn a little bit more of Greece, Greek, and I have spent time in Greece, in Athens, Thessalonica, Meteora, and quite a lot of time at Mykonos on Super Paradise Beach, <laughs> which I enjoyed very much. <laughs> Um, just about the book and how it came to be, if you mind if I just put my glasses on. Um, the project began because I had a conversation with Cole Hutchison, who's the AFL historian, 
at one stage um, if anyone had ever documented all the players' servers and no one had ever done it. So I volunteered to do so. Um, I work at Essendon Football Club for 10 years and part of my uh, job there and running the Hall of Fame was to help locate players to um, partake in our Anzac Day services. So that just grew and grew and Cole said keep notes. So I kept notes and that's what ended up. So it's over 500 pages actually. So what I did was I had a database of 8,000 names to begin with, so I researched each one of those 8,000 players between 1897 and um, 1972 when national conscriptions stopped. So I went up to Canberra eight or nine times into the National Archives so I could work from original records and that's where you get all the interesting gossip, is that the right word, and fascinating things. Some I found I have not put in print. Um, one, I didn't think it was fair to families on some of the things that I found in the war service records. Some I loved, the national servicemen. I interviewed about 200 of them. Um, that took two to three hours on each one because they all told me about every game they'd ever played and they were all naughty. So some of the things they got up to, fantastic. One guy took his girlfriend to the Dramana Drive-In in a tank. Um, <laughs> Neil Roberts, who's a Brownlow medalist, he had a good business going up at Pakapanyul, charging a shilling for a haircut. Another one who was, dare I say, a Collingwood person, um, came down every week to train with his sergeant and they managed to bring down enough building materials from Paka to build a house in Melbourne. So I got to hear about all these stories, which was fantastic. Um, just to give you stats, because it's football, um, six players served in the Boer War, World War I and World War II. I'm not sure whether that was duty or their wives were saying, yes, good idea, go. A hundred players served at Gallipoli and 17 of them died at Gallipoli including five on the first day, the 25th of April. And there's no way of knowing who was first out of all of those, of course, in the mayhem. Over the time, um, 160 players have died on active service, including four. Of course, as soon as you publish a book, you find extras. And we found another four who died. And I've printed those off, and if you want a book, they're up there as an addendum. So. The hardest thing was trying to track down players because a lot of them changed their names, changed their dates of birth, ran away from their mums. There was one from Tassie, came over and his mother found out and came back and took him back home because he was underage. Um, so all of those sort of things made it a quite a long process to absolutely get the right person. Um, I worked on what positions they played just before I begin, how many people actually barrack for a footy team here, an AFL footy? Oh, great. <laughs> I thought you might be all soccer people. <laughs> That's great. Um, sorry? Oh, good grief. Right. Okay, well, you're not doing too well at the moment. <laughs> um, oh, I know. It was a good match, I'd tell you. <laughs> So, in the Boer War, um, I found about 40 players actually served in the Boer War, which is one that a lot of people are not aware of in South Africa, and they saw the duty to the British and went over and served there. And I was talking today to a lady whose grandfather won the VC in the Boer War. Um, I'm just... Sorry. So, of the 8,000... 2,500 players served since 1897 in the Boer War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and of course those who did national service. And there were about 200 of those who did national service. People often ask me how I got the title of my book. Um, that came from when I was researching a player from St Kilda, who only played seven games, named Stan Brady. I was going through his file 
And in the middle of it, I found a letter from his father saying, I've given you six sons to this war. So I thought, I better have a look at that. So I went through all the rest of the, um, the brothers' um, files. And in one, misfiled, was a letter from Stan, written home from Gallipoli. And obviously, Mum had been sending over the newspaper reports of footy. And the last line at the bottom of the letter said, Mum, it's harder than football here. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, that's the title from a book. The whole letter is on the frontispiece of the book that I've written up there, if you want to read that. This is a, an Irish family who came from Dunkeld, down in the Western District. They had um, 14 kids, Paul Catherine, mum. Six of the boys enlisted. One was killed at Gallipoli, and Stan wrote a lot to his mum saying, I can't find my brother. He was killed and they never found his body. Another brother was killed on the Western Front, couldn't find his body either. Um, another one in that time period was um, murdered in Perth. And just before the war, Catherine had lost three of her little girls to illness. So out of all her kids, she only had eight left. Um, Stan came home from Gallipoli and died within two to three months of getting back from pleurisy and pneumonia, obviously brought on by exposure at Gallipoli. And then mum died six months later and I always felt she'd died of a broken heart because she'd lost so many of her kids. We think Stan is the one um, in the back row on the right hand side with the air sticking out. <laughs> so we, hope, we think that Stan, no one can positively identify him, but we think that's who it is. Um, Stan played for Matoa Football Club along with his brothers and Stan's in the back row um, with the ears sticking out and his brother Bill is in the second front row on the far left. So the boys all played footy which was normal for a country team. He also played for Ararat Football Club and when Stan passed away from pneumonia in 1921, the whole team wore black armbands in remembrance of him. So. Moving on to those who were killed in action. John Montagu Drake, a Hawthorne football player. He only played three games and had one goal. Um, there are probably a lot more who served in Crete and Greece that I don't know about because all the World War I records are digitised, which you can access through the National Archives. Not all the World War II ones are, so I had to go up there to actually read their files. They, um, they've got a plan to have them done by 2023. So hopefully then I'll be able to see if there's any more who served in Greece and Crete. And I'm sure there are more, I just haven't been able to find them. Um, Drake was a clerk, an article clerk, and he was one of a family of six. And he kicked his only goal on debut against Fitzroy, and then he was injured and played his other two games at the end of the season. He enlisted in December 1939, and he'd served in Palestine before heading to Greece. His he was killed when his unit was um, defending two enemy bridges at Brallis Pass to stop them being repaired by the Germans. He was on duty for 31 hours, which enabled two infantry brigades to withdraw. And sadly, he lost both of his legs in an explosion while sheltering underneath a ledge. He was 37 years old when he died. And he was one of 43 fellow soldiers from the 2nd Field Regiment to die on active service. And his older brother had also served in World War I. He's buried at Philerion War Cemetery in Greece. Please forgive my pronunciation of Greek words. I hope I got that right. My fave, Godfrey Robert Golden. Um, he was the four, um, he was a champion schoolboy footballer for Etzen and Footy Club and he was rumoured to be the successor for the great Dick Reynolds, for those of you who are Essendon fans. Anybody here, Essendon fan? Good. Pleased to hear that. <laughs> um, he had a season in the reserves in 1940 and then was enlisted in March 41 and he was just 22. He served in Libya before he was deployed to Greece and in March 
42, he left Greece and was sent to the Middle East and then on to Papua New Guinea as part of a force defending well. That was quite common for World War II men to come back from the Middle East and then go up to Papua New Guinea to serve there. He was shot in the bladder and died after six days in hospital and then buried the following day. He was only 26. His family had a great history of services. His father served in World War I and his two brothers also served in World War II. Um, two years ago, before COVID, I was in Papua New Guinea and went to the war cemetery where he's buried. I couldn't find his grave site, but the cemetery is so peaceful and so beautifully cared for, as are all of them. So, rest peacefully. And that photo, by the way, is the only photo known to be of Godfrey Golden. There are none at the club. Um, and no one has any other photos of him. So I was sort of glad that I found that. Um, Wallace Hickford Mills, he had a one game with St Kilda, didn't kick any goals. He was an apprentice plumber and he enlisted at the age of th uh, 24, two, de two years after his game with the Saints. He was in Crete from March to June 41, where he was promoted to a sergeant. And after remaining in the Middle East, he returned to Australia in November 42 and a year later was killed in a crash between an army vehicle in which he was a passion passenger and an RAF truck. He died two days later from severe injuries to his head. Well, I went up to photograph his gravesite. I've tried to photograph every AFL player who's deceased and that includes those in Gallipoli, France, New Guinea, and you'd be surprised at how many there are in Australia. I went to Cairns and got the bus to go out to Atherton Cemetery and arrive. Julie took his photograph and he's buried very close to a Richmond player called Bill Garvey in the Atherton Cemetery. Went back to Atherton to get the bus home. No buses. This was on a Saturday. So I thought, what on earth am I going to do? I am stuck in Atherton. The only thing open was McDonald's. Um, so I managed to ring the bus company and the bus company had to send a bus down from the Gulf to come and get me and bring me back to Cairns. So I went back to the lady who told me about the bus services and informed her <laughs> of the mistake. But anyway, I got home. So. Um, there are 164 men buried up in the Atherton Cemetery. Atherton is about two and a half hours inland from Cairns and because there were so many servicemen up around that area, a lot of them died not so much in active service but in accidents and things like that. Okay. Bereford Stanley Riley, I always thought that was a very distinguished name. He's got, he's a three team player. He served in Iraq and Egypt and on July 23rd in 1943 he was a wireless gunner on board one of the eight Martin Baltimore aircraft taking part in a low-level bombing attack against German military establishments as part of Operation Thesis, which was in response to Germans murdering the Cretans. A further 120 Allied aircraft were also involved. And as Riley's plane approached the eastern end of Crete, five of the Baltimore planes were shot down and one ditched. And Riley's plane sent out an OS, oh, sorry, an SOS at 8.50 a.m. But nothing further was heard and no sign of his four crew were ever found. When people died, there was always um, their effects sent home and part of what was sent home to his um, family was a footy jumper which he'd obviously taken with him. So his name on the Alamein Memorial in Syria. A lot of people who their bodies have never been found, so they are at least remembered on uh, various memorials around Australia. Just as a sideline, I found players are buried in over 20 countries and I've tried to photograph each one of them. There's one in Sierra Leone, and I don't think I'll ever get to see that one, but it's amazing how they're buried all over the world. Um, Leo Gus Young, he's a bombardier, played 10 games with Hawthorne. He came from Mafra and was noted for his marking and his high 
drop kicks as a forward. He enlisted in August 1940 and was posted to Greece, attached to an anti, uh, sorry, an anti-aircraft regiment. His unit was posted to protect, protect RAF Heraklikion, is that right? Airport in Crete, and he died in a campaign to defend the island against Germans. It's thought he drowned at sea when his crew were cut off and he was picked up by a destroyer, which was then bombed and sunk, and his body was never found. He was only 26 years old. And this is the only known photo of Young, which came from his pay book. Hawthorne Football Club don't have any team, him um, photograph in any team at all. So that's the only photo we have of Leo or Gus Young. He's remembered on the Athens Memorial along with 331 other Aussies. If you would like to read the story of him, Hawthorne Football Club have got a brilliant uh, detailed story about him on their website. They've got two terrific historians there who are both very good writers. So you could um, read up a little bit more about his history. Um, George Hawking, Carlton, somebody told me they barracked for Carlton. I can't remember who that was. Four games. Um, he was a forward who came from Rushworth up in northern Victoria. He was described as a safe player in a shore mark. He was a barman when he enlisted in July 1940 and he was 38 which is pretty mature age. He left Melbourne in February 1941 and he was in the Middle East six weeks later and eight weeks later he was serving in Greece as a driver and a mechanic for 18 months before returning to Australia via Salon. He then had a stint in New Guinea in August 1942 and was later diagnosed with heart problems and scabies. He'd served in the army for six years and was discharged in 1946. So he came home safely, which is good. Charles Berry Parsons, another Carlton player. He was a manager of the Griffiths Tea Company. So he moved to South Australia in Perth for his job after a two-year career with Carlton as a halfback flanker. He returned to Victoria to enlist in June 1940 and was posted to the Middle East four months later. And in March 41, he was part of the Allied force attempting to stop the invasion of Greece by the German troops. He was evacuated safely and returned to Australia and was commissioned as a lieutenant in 1942 until his discharge in 1945. Harold Olberston, captain played one game for Collingwood. Where's my Collingwood fan? Someone up the back was. <laughs> oh, more than one. One game, one down. Then he went over to Hawthorne. He played his only game for the Maggies in 35 against Carlton and then he joined his brother Alec at Hawthorne and he remained in the team for 60 consecutive games until his enlistment in the army in 1940. He also played district cricket for Collingwood and Hawthorne, so he was a good athlete. He served in Palestine, Crete and Crete in 40 and then went on to Port Mar Moresby. The war took his toll and he spent a lot of time in Heidelberg Hospital after he returned suffering from anxiety, obviously what we would call PSTD now. Both his brothers served, Alex served, uh, played for Hawthorne and North and Ken uh, played for Richmond and Melbourne and they both served in the RAF. So they had a whole family history of service. Please stop me if there's a question you'd like to ask along the way. Russell Madden, he was a Geelong player and an Essendon player. I apologise for the little typo down the bottom there. It should be 1934. He played with the VFA club Sandringham and then captain coached the Manga Pla Premiership team in 38 in the Albury and District League. And he was an engineer and he spent 18 months in the Middle East before serving for two months in Greece. Not keen on army discipline, he went AWOL many times and then was, but was still promoted to corporal, ending up a lance sergeant. He went on to serve in New Guinea and the Torres Strait Islands for 10 months before he was discharged in December 1945. Um, John Black Patterson. He was a talented athlete from Geelong College before he attended Mel uh, Melbourne Uni to study industrial chemistry. 
Um, the break in his football career, where you can see he played 1920 for Geelong and then 24, 26, it's thought that he was either playing in the reserves or playing for a local team, which was possibly Newtown Chilwell, which is quite near to Geelong. He enlisted in October 39, commissioned as a lieutenant, and he fought in Greece and Libya, but became a POW and was held in the off-flag 78 Eichstadt um, camp in Bavaria in July 41. That photo there is, if you look carefully, you can see they're playing hockey in the background. I'm sure that the camp was not as idyllic as having games of um, hockey being played. So. He was mentioned in uh, dispatches for his services rendered in the Middle East from January 41 to July 41. I haven't been able to find a record of why he was mentioned in dispatches and that's quite common. Usually if you win a military cross or um, DFC or DFO, there's a citation that tells you exactly why, but often with a mention of dispatches, it's just um, that they did something terrific and they added it into the reports. He was discharged in December 1946 so, and came home safely. Um, Donald Quatermain, I apologise for the photo, but it was the only one we could find of him. He was 31 and married, but he asked his mum to be the next of kin, so I don't know what was happening there. He, made, he was made a lieutenant in March 41 and embarked, embarked for Greece the following month and then was reported um, missing and then he was found to be a POW in July 41. He was one of the 3,102 Australian troops captured and he was interned at five different camps, um, including Salonika and Warburg, where he was for a whole year. Conditions in that camp were deplorable and in one camp he was in a hut with 160 others in starvation conditions. He occasionally received Red Cross parcels, but very little mail. He was also mentioned in dispatches for distinguished service in the Middle East. He was recovered in May 1945. They always use that term, um, taking people out of POW camps as being recovered. And then he was brought home to England for treatment and then got home to Australia and was discharged in uh, August 1945. So. Richard Eason won the Military Cross. He also played for two different teams, as you can see there. Um, he was one of four players to be given a surprise transfer from Footscray and he went on to the Essendon Footy Club to play a couple of games at the end of the season. He enlisted in 1939, ranked as a lieutenant. He served in Libya, Greece and Crete after arriving in North Africa in 1940. Um, he returned to Australia in 42 and then went back up to New Guinea in 45. He was awarded the Military Cross for outstanding coolness and courage in an action in which 11 of his escort were either killed or wounded. He fought in a grenade battle for 12 hours against the Japanese troops. So um, He later became a brigadier in the Army Reserve and a commander of the 3rd Division of the Royal Australian Artillery in 49. He was one of eight children but he died at the young age of 65. Um, Henry Joseph Jacobs also played for two different clubs. Not a lot, but he played. Um, after four games with Fitzroy, he switched over to Hawthorne mid-season in 39 and played a couple of games with the Hawks. Two months after his final VFL game, he enlisted and stating his occupation to be a motor driver. Um, he was in the Middle East for two years and in Greece for six weeks in 1941, having left Egypt in early April. He then went on to the um, Northern Territory and was commissioned in 1942. In 1944, he was posted to Port Moresby, but he had severe health problems, so they returned him to Australia so he could be discharged in 1945. And there was no team photo of him or nothing we could find at the footy clubs. So that is a photo of him at a mature age, obviously. The next one, you may recognise the name because he was a Brownlow duo, Brownlow medalist, won twice in 26 and 28. He's got a famous name for Melbourne Football Club, warns me. 
He served in World War I at Gallipoli and then in France and between the wars he was an outstanding footballer, of course, for the Demons, being the first player to ever win two Brownlow medals. Later he was captain and coach and an interstate rep. In World War II, he arrived in the Middle East in January 41, working with the One Corps petrol company for 15 months. He was in Greece in April 1941 and took part in the Syrian campaign, delivering new trucks into Syria. And he had two stints in Egypt as well. He returned to Darwin in 42 and then had a similar role with petrol supply in New Guinea and Burma. And in 1947, he was also mentioned in dispatches for his distinguished service in operations in Borneo. Are there any Melbourne supporters here? No? Oh. Um, only because you may recognise the name John Lord, who was a famous player. This is his dad, who played for St Kilda and Melbourne. He was a clerk when he enlisted in July 40. But he served as a shorthand typist for Field Marshal Blamey in the Middle East and Greece. He also served in Syria, Northern Australia and New Guinea for seven years, where he was wounded in the back. His army file stated that he displayed many of the qualities of leadership. After the war, he was elected mayor of Echuca three times, and there's a photo of him escorting Queen Elizabeth on a visit in 1954. He was also secretary of the um, St Kilda Footy Club and father of the four times Melbourne premiership player, John Lord. Uh, Sydney Barker Jr. I got the right one. Yes, um, they played for North Melbourne Footy Club. And any North fans here? No, because his father, um, the award for uh, best and fairest, is named after him, Sid Barker. Anyway, he played from 30 to 33, and after a year in Egypt and Palestine, he went to Greece in March 41. He was also mentioned in dispatches for service between February 41 and July 41. And also in May, he was posted as missing in action in Crete. Um, he was later found and rejoined his unit. He had plenty of run-ins with the authorities, not keen on army um, discipline at all. He missed parade, he went AWOL, lost his equipment, lost pay. He was a bit of a rebel, I think. Anyway, his um, dad, that's the name of the North Melbourne Best and Fairest, is called the Barker Best and Fairest Award after him. Raymond Clark um, played one game for North and his only game was in round one in 1930 against Geelong when he was aged 21. And he came from a tiny town called Tura down in Gippsland. This is his German POW card, where he lists himself as a butcher, although he enlisted, when he um, joined up, he enlisted himself as a labourer. But I think the German word there is Fleischer, so that's butcher. And there's also a photograph there of one of the um, POW camps that he was in. No, is that the next one? Oh, sorry, there we go, yes. Yeah photograph of gentlemen um, servicemen in um, POW camps. Right, Raymond Clark, uh, another one game player. He enlisted in March, travelled to Palestine and uh, via Colombo, which was quite common to go via to and fro through Colombo in India. And then he went on to Greece. Um, he got fined because he missed the boat in Colombo and um, got reported as AWOL. Uh, he, was, he also was reported missing in June 41 and was found in the notorious Stalag V 3B POW camp in Lambsdorff, which is in Poland. Um, after his recovery in May 45, he went to England for care and was discharged, suffering from tuberculosis and a perforated eardrum. Um, he spent nearly five years overseas, as was quite common. Um, Edward James Morecambe, another North player. I should, I should have declared myself at the beginning of this. I 
I'll interrupt at this point that I look after the Sydney Swans archival collection in, in Melbourne and I've done that for the last 17 years. I also look after the North Melbourne Football Club archival collection. So I've been with them for 10 years. Um, I'm still on committees with the Essendon Football Club and um, I do a lot of work with other clubs. So I've got a pretty broad thing on <laughs> all clubs. Um, Edwin James Morkin came from Brunswick Footy Club and he played as a half-back flanker and half-forward. He had played 16 games with Brunswick before he was um, taken over to North Melbourne Footy Club. Uh, he enlisted at the age of 43, stating he was a labourer. And while serving in Jerusalem, he was in a an affray with 14 others over beer, which led to a court-martial hearing. And I couldn't find out whether he was put in jail or fined or lost privileges or what, but anyway, he was court-martialed. Um, when he was in Greece in 41, he was wounded in the buttock and the thigh, which led to health problems when he returned to Australia. But this didn't stop him from playing another 22 games for North, wearing his original number 26 after he returned from the war. So he played two games in 44 and then every game in 1945. So being shot in the derriere didn't stop him from playing footy. Harold Shedlick, um, a St Kilda player, only three games and he kicked one goal. He was born in South Australia in 1915, enlisting over there in October 39, stating his occupation was as a station hand. He served in the Middle East, then Crete and Greece, and he was one of the 6,540 Australians involved in the Crete campaign. After returning from war service, he played his St Kilda games in the last three rounds of uh, 1947, aged nearly 32. Um, he played in against Carlton, Geelong and Melbourne in those three games. And he died in 2003 at the age of 88. And I recently found his kit bag was for sale on eBay and sold for $47. So, which, going back, that's a 60-year-old kit bag that somebody wanted. <laughs> right, John or Jack Lowe's, I have been unable to find any photo of him. St Kilda have been unable to find any photo of him. All we know is that he is in this team photo, but no one's been able to identify who he is or which one he is. The gentleman holding the footy is Stuart King. Stuart King was captain and then he was killed in action in February 1943. So, sad. Uh, Lowe's debuted in round five against Footscray and then played in the next three games and then had no more senior games. He enlisted in December 39 and he served in the Middle East and then was posted to Greece in May 1941. He returned home via Salon, spending three months there, and then in late 42 he went on to New Guinea. The army discharged him as an essential worker in, as he was in a shearing shed as a wool presser and he had months of treatment for a knee problem, so they got him out of the army. Many of the players served as essential workers. A lot of the Essendon players worked in the munitions factories over in Maribyrnong, and they were deemed as essential workers, so they were able to continue to play footy all through the war. Um, if you can identify him, St Kilda Football Club would be very happy, and so would I, but we just don't know who he is, which person he is. Danny War, um, another St Kilda player. He played every round in each of his two years at the Saints, kicking 24 games as a rover. He worked as a truck driver and came from South Melbourne, enlisting in 1940. After his return via Salon, he was posted to New Guinea in 1943 and then discharged in June 1944. He went on to coach in the Australian Capital Territory from 47 to 53. Um, including Canberra representative teams. He coached those in 48, 50 and 51. And he died in Canberra at the age of 67 in 1972. David Dick, now I've cheated on this one. No one has been able to find a photo of David Dick. So I've put in his dad instead. His dad was captain of four consecutive premierships from 91 through to 94. So I'm just hoping he kind of looked like his dad. So 
so it's a bit of a cheat. <laughs> we just could not find, none of the clubs could find him in any team photo or had any links to any of his family. Um, he was a butcher and he was amongst the first to enlist because he was, went in in October 1939. He served for a month in Greece in 1941, uh, working in a postal unit in, after, uh, prior to that in Egypt. And his father, of course, was Alex Dick, who was very famous as a four premiership player. Um, after playing with Footscray, David went on to coach Sandringham Footy Club and he died in 1982. Uh, at the age of 81, so hopefully he looks like Dad. Never know. Um, oh, sorry, I can go back to that one. Um, if anyone has relatives who have served and you want to look up their records, um, most of the Boer War one-page records are digitised. All of the World War I records are now digitised and they were done as a gift to the nation in 1988. About a third of the World War II records are digitised and they are aiming to have them all done by 2023, hopefully, but with the cutbacks on the National Archives, which I'm sure you've read about, um, don't know. Career in Vietnam, there's only basic information available and the National Servicemen, there's no official nominal role but when I was interviewing players, they could always tell me who was playing, who they were playing footy with in um, national servicemen's footy leagues. There was a very active football group in Vietnam, um, and they played. And if you would really like to see some terrific footy from 1916, if you go onto YouTube, the very famous London game, which is made up of different teams from Australia. One team's wearing the map of Australia and the other one's got a kangaroo on the front. That has recently been digitised and colourised and Eastern Wood has done the commentary on it. It's a fantastic thing to read. The King came to watch the match and the goal umpires, instead of having white flags, had British Union Jacks, so they were all waving. But it's fascinating to see what footy looked like back in 1916, I think it was. So... Um, that's the end of my presentation, but if that is stole, if there's any questions, I'll be very happy to read them. If I can just make one comment on the research that I did, it was fascinating. Um, a lot of the times I was crying because some of the things were just so sad to read. A lot of it was so funny. I was roaring laughing at the antics they got up to and I loved what the National Servicemen did. I'll just tell you one tale from the National Servicemen. Um, they were all lined up at Pucker ready to get their kit at a train station and the Sydney to Melbourne train went past so they all saluted and they were all in the nude. <laughs> so, um, it's been a, f a fabulous thing to research and find. Um, families have been grateful that their sons have been recognised. And of course, a lot of the six years went into not only the players, but you got led off into their wives. They often married overseas, or their wives were also in the services. Um, I tracked down grandparents that had served, brothers that have served, so you got the whole family. So I hope in this brick that I've paid tribute to all of them. And as I said before, once you publish your book, you always find more, um, it comes out. So I've had, there are four more players now. One who enlisted under his mother's maiden name and took 13 years off his date of birth to enlist, so that was very tricky to try and find him. Another one, the AFL always had his name as Patterson with a double T. He was actually a Patterson with one T. So when I tracked him down, that was another one. There was another one who served with the British um, Air Corps over in London and we didn't have a record of him. Um, but I've tracked him down and he lived quite close to the Oval, that very famous football ground, there, or cricket ground really. Um, so I think that's about it, if there's any more questions. Oh, just one other thing before. The one thing that fascinated me about the World War I players was how little they were. To be six foot was so rare um, mainly, they were five, six, five, seven in the old terms. 
and dare I say their chest measurements were less than mine. It was amazing how little they all were and off they went. So, and the other thing that struck me about the World War I records was how many had Lindsay in their names. But the best one to find and the easiest one to find was the first World War player whose second name or his second Christian name was Shrapnel. So that was so easy to find him. I think he's the only one in town. So thank you very much for inviting me on this very special day. I know it's a special anniversary for you. So thank you very much. If that is done. Thank you, Barbara, for that quite moving presentation. And probably one or two years after all the World War II records have been digitised after 1923, we look forward to the second edition so you can include that extra I information. I am working with the AFL on that because the AFL actually paid to publish the book. Um, we had a mad rush. I was proofreading Christmas morning to get it out in time for the Anzac Day 2015. Um, I've actually found... 46 more players because often if you're addressing companies like this people will come up and say hey I served and you know I'm not in your book what's wrong um, and that's why you can add on to the list and of course we found another four now who've died so that's 160 players who've died on active service and I really hope I don't find any more. Might have to make it a two volume. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any questions from the audience if you can just come to the front and use the mic please so it can be uh, captured in the recording. Nick, you want to come to the oh. front, please? Or? I hope it's not tricky. <laughs> I, wasn't going to, I wasn't, wasn't going to ask a question, but I just felt compelled. You had a photograph of the Bradys. Yes. And, um, and a lot of the family died either in the war or very soon after. Yes. Do you have any words from the mother? No, I have no idea how the letter actually got into the brother's file of mm. that Stan had written home to his mother, mm. but there are no letters from his mother to Stan. Mm. I can only presume that she sent parcels over to the war because the boys all knew about football and that's why I said it's harder than football here. So it kept up and kept in touch um, via footy because the boys had all played footy, of course. Yeah. I was actually wondering about her attitude to the war. Well, I don't know how she would have felt. It would have been terrible to lose two of her boys with no well, bodies ever found. Well how do you get over that? I was actually thinking of before they went, like they before they enlisted or when they enlisted. Yeah, World War I and players, a lot of them went because they felt it was their duty to Britain. I found one of the Geelong players took his car deck chairs and his um, bathing suit. So whether they just thought they were going on a journey, um, the army confiscated the car in London after he, um, he tried to come back and it was brought back to Australia and became the first ambulance in Geelong. I think there was a strong feeling back in World War I that it was our duty to go. My great uncle was killed at the Battle of Passchendaele. Um, which I've been over to visit his gravesite several times. All of our family have, even down to the little kids, we've all been to see him. Um, so every family was affected and I think it was more, I don't know, I'd say every person who enlisted had their own story. Mm. Um, I know one guy was a widower with an eight year old and he still volunteered and went. Mm. And you just don't know what the backstory is behind any of them. but. For Catherine to lose so many of her boys and her little girls mm. must have been terrible for Laura. So. Thank you. Barbara, um, in those letters sent home by those that served in Crete, was there any description of the Cretan landscape or the Cretan people um, in those letters? And no, there were no letters that I found. Um, the only reference that I found in the World War II records was served in Greece or was embarked for Greece, or embarked for Crete, or embarked for Palestine. There was no personal letters at all in any of the World War II records. In the World War I, yes. And how they got copied and into those files, I just don't know. And how Catherine's letter, to St um, Stan's letter back, 
to his mother, how did that end up in a World War I file? I just don't know. Because they didn't have photocopy facilities at Gallipoli. Um, so I just, it's a mystery to me. So I don't know. Gina, would you like to come to the front, please? Yep. So while it's true that a lot of people volunteered to fight in the First World War, it's worth mentioning that there was a huge campaign in Australia against conscri conscription, yep. which culminated in a referendum which was won against conscription. Mm. So there was an equally strong mood against um, young men being conscripted into fighting a war which was a war about empire. And that was really led by Catholic Australians, Daniel Mannix, in particular, mm. um, so it's I, worth it's worth talking about that because yeah. yeah, people did feel an obligation to empire, but equally there was a very strong feeling that we didn't belong in that war. Yeah, I haven't explored that aspect. I'm aware of it, and I think there's been a couple of books written about it as well, um, but I didn't look at it at um, the time on that. And because of the records, you can only presume why people volunteered and why they went. Um, you can't ask them because they're no longer with us, sadly, yeah. Um, I've got a question here from one of our Facebook followers, Theo. Um, who's the earliest recorded um, football player that served in the war? Oh, gosh. Well, it would have been one of the Boer War ones. Um, two of them died over there. And if you go to the gardens in St Vincent's Place, there's a lovely tribute to one of the players there. I would have to say those two would be the two earliest. Um, I do have their dates of birth in my book. If you want me to look them up, I could. Um, so that would be the earliest, I'd say. But 40 players served in the Boer War, but I'd have to go through and check their dates of birth to see who was the first and the earliest. Any further questions uh, for Barbara? Yes, no? Okay, um, sorry, we've got one more. I think that was included in the introduction, but there's a question on um, how many AFL players um, served in Crete through the war? Uh, yeah. I found 22, 22. but um, I have to say that I haven't reviewed every um, World War II record. I went through as many as I could get because you have to order them and I do them at 100 at a time and some of the files were three or four pages, some were over 100. So I could go up for three or four times at a, at a time and go through 100 files. So I reckon that there are more players that served in Crete. I just don't know yet. So hopefully once they're all digitised, and I bring out the second version, <laughs> um, that we'll be able to add that to the 22. Um, so question if you've encountered any um, players of, let's say, Greek-Australian origin that served in any of those wars. Very good question. No. I know there are Greek players who've served or have played AFL because there's actually a team of the century of Greek players. There's a team of the century of Italian players. No, that's a very good question. No, I don't recall. I think I would have made a note of it if they had a Greek heritage. Yeah. yeah. I, I think there were Greeks who served in those wars, but they weren't necessarily football players. From, yeah. From what I've... I've the criteria for my book was only that you played one senior game of VFL footy. No, I didn't come across... That's a good question. I've never come across any Greek people, I don't think, or a Greek players, yeah. Okay, okay last call for questions? Okay. Barbara, thank you for that sort of um, moving um, talk. Um, just a small uh, bottle of wine that gives oh, appreciation for... Lovely. Thank you very much. If that is so, everyone. <laughs> and... I recommend you all um, obtain a signed copy of uh, Barbara's book, Harder Than Football, which is available for sale at the back. Thank um, you for coming tonight and hope to see you next week in other seminars as well. Thank you. Thank you.